Microinverters have been a hit in residential solar for how they simplify the installation, provide panel level monitoring and shade mitigation, and meet rapid shutdown code requirements. Can next gen microinverters do the same for commercial solar? Here to make the pitch today is Jason Higginson, head of marketing for AP Systems in the US. Hey, Jason, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having me on. So, Jason, uh, AP Systems recently launched the QT2, a robust microinverter for the CNI space. Before we zoom in on that, I wanted to zoom out more broadly and talk about cost, if we could start there, because that's often where conversations <laughs> would end, right? When it comes to microinverters yeah, exactly. on, a, on a large roof. So, uh, have, have microinverters become more competitive in commercial solar? There's been a lot that has changed with microinverters over the past 10 years. So if we were talking 10 years ago, it would have been kind of an open and shut case. Microinverters are only used for residential. Um, there's lots of kind of uh, preconceptions about what microinverters were good for. And uh, so I've, I've come on the show today to, uh, to bust some myths about microinverters and commercial. Let's talk about how uh, that conversation has, has typically ended in the past pretty quickly uh, on why microinverters did not make sense historically for commercial projects. Um, and the first one you brought up, too expensive. And I'm glad that we get a chance to, to talk about that. So when you look at cost, historically, you've had string inverters at a very favor favorable cost for, for commercial solar. Microinverters came in at twice the price. Uh, sometimes more. And that's kind of where that conversation ended. But what we've seen over the last 10 years is the cost for microinverters dramatically have, have gone down. String inverters as well, but significantly more for microinverters, especially with AP systems where we've combined four inverters in one unit and it doesn't cost the same as producing four individual inverters. So uh, you also add in the cost of a rapid shutdown system since the NEC uh, requirement for rapid shutdown, and it comes in at 50 to 70% of the inverter cost added on top of it. So immediately you're looking at a much more competitive pricing with traditional string systems plus rapid shutdown in comparison with microinverters. And it, the system, they're, they're coming in to 1% to 3% uh, over under uh, on comparable system pricing. So microinverters have gotten very aggressive uh, when it comes to those commercial applications, and they're more cost competitive than ever. So, myth busted. <laughs> very good. Yeah, and that's so. That's very interesting. Um, what system sizes are we talking about? You know, at some point, sure. maybe I, I assume that math, you know, tips or you know, like what what is that pivot point? Well, that was our expectation too. Uh, we've been able to get into commercial solar in the past with uh, with some of our other microinverters, but uh, when you get to the larger system sizing, it's it's always you know you get to half a megawatt to a megawatt, like it, it's made more sense to go with another solution. But with the QT2, we were penciling out one megawatt installations and we were still within that one to three percent. It's just been a game changer with this QT2 on, on how competitive we're able to get on those system pricing. The next conversation stopper for microinverters in commercial solar historically is, you know, usually they were single phase and, you know, so designing the system to balance the phases was super complex and maybe not worth someone's time. Um, I do know that QT2 is three phase, so that I, I assume removes that hurdle. So then what about uh, moving on to power? Because we're connecting to four modules, like you said, to make the pricing work, but will that limit the module wattage that we're able to pursue? That's a great question. And that's another one that we that we see a lot too is well microinverters are they're for residential. They're they're low power. You use it with you know smaller panels than you would see in, in commercial solar. And that's no longer true. The other thing that you brought up, the the three phase, it's been a historically a hassle to take a, a microinverter and wire it into into three phase. And we've we've solved both of those problems with the QT2. The first of which being that that power output. So with our 208 volt version, it outputs uh, 432 watts per channel. And I've spoken on your show before too about you know that AC to DC ratio. You want to oversize a bit, and so we make that ideal for PV modules that are about that 550 watt range. You know you can go over, you can go under. We put the plus there 
uh, because we don't want people to think you can't do a 560 or a 600 watt panel on there. You can, uh, you just have so, uh, slightly more clipping. But this this size for microinverters is unheard of. Typically, you wouldn't see anything this large and four of them on one inverter. And that's what we have with this this design. And it's really designed to to handle those high output PV modules. And you see this interesting topology on the back for, for uh, high heat mitigation. Uh, when the, that uh, it's converting at those higher rates. That myth is also busted. I love doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it. And so when we're talking about wiring into three phases, that's um, also been another hassle because you have, you know, electricians on the roof that are they're trying to balance these phases. So with the traditional microinverter, you would see they would take a single phase microinverter and try to manually balance those phases. A lot of legwork, a lot of headaches, extra steps, and you compare that to the QT2 where it's three phase out of the box, line one, two, and three, and you're done. Making three phase plug and play was an important part of this uh, microinverter design. Myth busted. I paused waiting for it that time. Uh, <laughs> I guess that kind of brings me to another thing I was curious about was the uh, setup and commissioning. Is there anything new to, to mention there uh, that maybe is improved or uh, just different for installers to know about? So you would compare it to how you would install competing systems, but you would also uh, compare it to um, how many potential points of failure that you have on the roof. And I wanna talk about both of those. Traditionally, microinverters were much longer to install. You have one unit for every PV module. You also have potentially more points of failure. With the QT2 being a four-in-one, you have significantly fewer points of failure. So if you were looking at a 100 PV module system, where if you were looking at microinverters, you would have one microinverter for each panel, and you would have potentially 100 potential points of failure. And keep in mind, you're also installing one microinverter uh, behind every panel, uh, which is labor intensive. If you're looking at string plus optimizer, you have an optimizer for each PV module. You also have one to four inverter parts, depending on how large your, your system is on a rooftop. So you have 101 to 104 potential points of failure, and you have to install all those. When you look at the QT2, uh, because it's a four in one, it's on 100 PV module systems, 25 microinverters. So you're 75% fewer potential points of failure and significantly fewer units to install. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, sorry. And and myth busted. <laughs> so, so okay, you br bring up the points of failure as a good uh, segue uh, to what I wanted to talk about next. The last but most important thing here is safety. So microinverters by code are inherently compliant with rapid shutdown, but that does also mean more electronics up on the roof and more connectors up on the roof, maybe not compared to an optimizer based system, but you know, those are still up there and those could be scary uh, for building owners. So is there more to the safety argument for going with a microinverter based design? There is because when we design the microinverters, you're taking into account not just the rapid shutdown, but also high voltage DC on the roof. And uh, we've seen that uh, with, with some customers, they prefer not to have high voltage DC on their roof. Um, in many cases, schools, hospitals, you know, they have uh, a, a preference when, when it comes to uh, the safety of the people in their building. And, and that's not to say that DC systems are not safe. It comes down to customer preference. So we, we like that our system is 100%, you know, AC uh, behind the the PV module converts it uh, immediately, and all of your cables that are running across your roof and down uh, to your home run are AC and a low voltage at that. I also want to talk about micro versus a string inverter. So the string inverters also represent a, a potential single point of failure. Uh, so if you have one string inverter go down, you have 100% of your system not producing. With a microinverter, a QT2, for example, uh, it's four PV, mo PV modules. So on a 100 PV module system, it's only 4% of the system not producing energy. I mentioned the high voltage DC as a, a potential safety concern. And there, we've also seen one person capable of doing an installation with microinverters. They don't weigh very much uh, compared with um, 
two or more people having to uh, to hang a string inverter and uh, and mount that. Jason, as we wrap up here, I'm just wondering, is there anything else that I'm I'm missing? Like, you know, say I'm an installer who, you know, watched this pitch and thought like, okay, all that like, you know, makes sense. But I kind of still like the way I'm doing things. Why would I want to retrain my staff, take a chance on microinverters for commercial jobs? And maybe I, I, I feel pretty good about it. Um, is there like a, maybe a strategy or a way to do a trial run or like? You bring up a good example is, it is tried out. Compare it with uh, what you've traditionally been doing and pencil it out, see if it makes sense uh, cost-wise, see if it makes sense design-wise, and, uh, and, and try it out for a system, especially what we saw during COVID when there was you know, some, some supply chain issues. Uh, having a backup plan is always good. And you, you may find that uh, it's, uh, it's an easier installation. You may find that it uh, produces more energy over the life of the system. There are a couple more points too that uh, I, I want to make specifically when it comes to another big microinverter myth. And that has to do with, I don't have any shading on my site, so I don't need microinverters. And what I want to, to say to that is, is shading comes in many forms. So it's not simply shading from a tree or, or clouds or what have you, but uh, we've seen a lot, especially on commercial rooftops, everything from bird droppings to, to dust, but also microinverters perform better in snowy conditions. So places where that get a lot of snow, more filtered sunshine through, uh, getting through to the microinverter or through to the solar panel and uh, rain, cloudy days, microinverters simply perform better and have a lower LCOE over the life of the system. So myth busted there. <laughs> Very good. Well, lots of good info there. Lots of uh, myths busted. So Jason, thanks again for stopping by and taking the time to make the pitch. Thanks again, Chris. Appreciate it.